I've done more in in 47 months. I've done more than you've done in 47 years, Joe. Emotions boil over on all sides. Tonight, your voice will be heard directly by the president. And we change history forever by embracing the eternal truth that everyone is made equal by the hand of Almighty God. Our America This Week special report, President Trump Town Hall, starts right now. Oh, we want to welcome the Sinclair audience. This is America This Week. It's a very, very special occasion. It's a town hall at the White House with the Commander in Chief, President Donald Trump. We want to say thank you to Good. you thank in you. one second. I also want to say thank you to our invited guests. When they heard we were doing a town hall, they sent in some questions. They will be asking questions. We'll get to as many as we possibly can a little bit later in the show. We'd also like to point out this offer was extended to the Biden campaign. We have not heard back from them just yet. Obviously, you can see we are social distancing. People are in masks. We want to make sure the CDC and all the media is okay with, with all that, sir. Thank you again very much for doing this. Uh, well, thank America. you very much. Thank you. Uh, and our town hall is a big deal. It, it, two weeks left to, to the election. A lot of people have questions. They are, they're going to make their decisions on who they're going to vote for right now based on this next hour, sir. The debate is coming up on Thursday. I just wanted to talk to you. This came out this week that some new rules were added specifically that there was going to be a mute button added to Kirsten Welker's, um, I guess, repertoire of what she will be able to do as debate moderator. First of all, your thought on the new rule. Well, that's not fair. The plus they changed the topics, which isn't fair, just happened. Plus, Kristen Welker obviously is a heavily biased person with her parents being fundraisers and having supported the de Democrats. And she's a uh, Democrat. I know her well. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's just one of those things. But if you look at uh, the last uh, person had to leave in disgrace because it turned out that he was obviously very biased and uh, I wouldn't say that Chris Wallace did himself proud. So, but this is nothing new for President Trump. No. For, for Donald Trump, the, my life. the, the President uh, Trump also, there's been a, I guess, a perceived hostile media towards you. Um, what's your strategy going into this debate? A lot of people are saying you cut Biden, Biden off. Some people liked it. Others didn't. Any different uh, debate prep strategy? Well, a lot of people liked it. He was lying. He was, you know, going point after point, and uh, they weren't truthful points. So I uh, let him know that. I thought it was good. I think a lot of people agreed with that, and some people probably didn't. Some people think let him talk because he loses his train. He just loses it, and he doesn't speak the train of thought. But uh, we'll see what happens. I mean, you really have to be there. You know, I've done a lot of debating in the last four years, as you know, and it's worked out well. Or I guess we're not here, come to think of it. No, oh, it's called the White House, right? But the fact is that uh, you see, I, I find you always have to just wait. It's, uh, you have a strategy, but all of a sudden you change your strategy. We'll see what it is, whatever it is, it is. Speaking of strategy, Joe Biden, his strategy has been this week. He called uh, a lid, which for people who don't understand in the media, you call a lid when you're going to make no more news. You're not right. going to make any more appearances. He called the lid on Monday through the debate on Thursday. You take a completely different tact. You're out there on the campaign trail. What's working? Well, I'm going to Erie, Pennsylvania in a little while. Right after this interview, we have thousands and thousands of people. They've been there for two days already waiting. We had uh, we just got back from Arizona and many other places. And we're having tens of thousands of people go to each one. And the spirit's been incredible. He's taken a different thing. And I think he doesn't want to be asked about his family because it's corrupt. What they've done is corrupt. And nobody's ever seen anything like it. When you look at the laptop, we call it the laptop from hell. And when you look at what, uh, what they've done and the, as a family where uh, the son follows the father into these countries and they walk away with tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, it's ridiculous. And then the press doesn't want to cover it. And big tech doesn't want to cover it. I'm going to get to the big tech in a second with regards to this. But right now, is there, is there anything? I, I, clearly, there could be things that you could consider unethical. Is there anything you think has been done with the Bidens, Hunter and his father, Joe Biden, well, that's illegal? Got one letter that he gets 10%. They have another one, I think, it said 
but that he gets 10 percent. You, did you see that? I did. Okay. I mean, well, I think he called it 10 for 10 for the guy. big man or the, the big, big guy. guy. He's the big guy. Uh, no, it's uh, it's terrible. It's terrible. Look in Moscow, three and a half million dollars from the mayor of Moscow's wife, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars a month to sit on a board in Ukraine about energy, and he knows nothing about energy, and admits he knows nothing about energy, and and many other things. No, it's it's a corrupt enterprise. There's no question about it. You know, uh, the New York Post broke the story, um, and. Twitter immediately blocked yeah. whole New York Post Twitter uh, handle off Twitter, and others. I, I believe Kaylee McEnany was pulled for a while as well. Do you feel that Twitter and Facebook are um, are are cheating? Are biased in this election? Oh, 100 percent. And frankly, uh, that's turning out to be as big a story as the corruption itself. They are trying to protect him because that's the way it is with the Democrats. It's a part of the Democrat Party, I guess. But they're trying to protect Biden from this corruption where they got caught. And that's turning out to be just as big a story. Censorship? Of course. I mean, it's uh, at a level that nobody thought possible. Election interference? Yeah, 100 percent. You know, there's this Rule 230, as you know. Rule 230 for our audience is... Uh, it's Section 230. Section 230. It, it, it basically shield some social media companies from the legal scrutiny that they would have had they not had the Section 230. Now, Ajit Pai, your FCC commissioner, said he wants to revisit 230. What do you think should happen? Well, we're going to see what happens. They have to make a ruling. But uh, nobody ever thought that Section 230 was going to be devised for purposes like this and what they're doing. Nobody's ever seen. Nobody has ever seen anything like this, Eric. And you know it better than anybody. Nobody's ever seen anything like this. You use Twitter, though, um, effectively. Are you concerned that um, they've, they've taken that tool, uh, that arrow out of your quiver? Well, you know, I have a voice that seems to be a pretty big voice, and we're here. This is where we are, and they fought me the last time. But they're fighting dirtier now and harder, and they've gotten bigger as companies. And the Democrats and the relationship to the media now has been totally exposed and dirty, very dirty. So, uh, but you know, explain that. I won last a little, time. a little further. Well, they work together. They work together uh, like nobody would ever believe. And the last time they did, and we won, and I think we're going to win again. We have more spirit now, and you see that, than we ever had four years ago. And four years ago, I think we set records on enthusiasm. And they measure enthusiasm, and we have more enthusiasm now than we did four years ago by a lot. The crowds are bigger, the rallies are bigger, the it's people are angry and happy at the same time. It's very interesting. They're angry at what they see going on. They spied on my campaign. We caught them. They w did more than spy on the campaign. They tried to take down a duly elected president of the United States. And uh, the whole thing is incredible. Not even believable, but we caught them. And now we're finding out this whole Biden thing with all the corruption. And at least I have a voice where I can talk to you. I can talk to other people and get the voice out. But uh, no, what, what the media has done, mainstream, lamestream, I call it lamestream media, what they've done is incredible. And now big tech on top of it. So, uh, but look, I'm here. I'm cutting taxes. They're raising taxes for a reason that's bad. You look at all of the things, Second Amendment, we're protecting the Second Amendment. Is, They're going to get rid of the is Second there more, Amendment. Is there more coming out about the Hunter Biden? I think Joe so. Biden? Yeah, I think so. I think a lot more. When? I don't want to talk about it, but I think a lot more. I think you'll see a lot more. Again, I'm not in charge of that, but I think you're going to see a lot more. One of the things um, I noticed this week is uh, you, you've been going back and forth with the press about Anthony Fauci. What's the relationship with Fauci? I, I get along with him fine, but he's made mistakes. And, uh, you know, when he said he, he really is uh, stopped from going on television, then you see him do 60 Minutes, not one of the greatest shows in the world. And he's not. And, but when you see it, but he said no masks, don't wear masks. And then he said wear masks. And uh, he didn't want me to stop people from coming in from China. And then he admitted it was a great move that I made against him. You know, I overrode him. 
But with all of that, I get along with him. I, I like him. He's uh, Tony. Well, you he's a nice you guy. called him a disaster. <laughs> so I didn't. Yeah, look, he's he's made bad moves, but uh, he's been there a long time. Um, this is, and I know this is hard to answer, but let me ask you this anyway. With COVID, is there anything that you think you could have done differently if you had a mulligan or a do-over on one aspect of of the way you handled it? What would it be? Not much. Look, it's all over the world. You have a lot of great leaders. There are a lot of smart people. It's all over the world. It came out of China. China should have stopped it. They stopped it from spreading into other parts of China after Wuhan. But China should have stopped it. No, not much. I, I did it very early. You know, Biden was criticizing me when he, he said I was xenophobic when I turned off, when I stopped, when I put the ban on China. And he said I was xenophobic. Think of that. And Pelosi did, too. She said, oh, it's terrible. It's ridiculous. I was months early. Now they come back and say, oh, I should have done it sooner. You couldn't have done it sooner. I did it at a very early point. Mr. President, why has the mask become such a political football? I mean, would it be that, that bad if we just said, you know what, open the economy. Yeah. Open your businesses. Go to restaurants. Open your stores. Open your schools. Just wear a mask. I have no problem with it. I have no problem with a mask. And frankly, some people don't like it. Some people don't like it scientifically. I mean, you know, you have a lot of different views than the mess. Look at Fauci, where he originally said, don't wear a mask. And then he comes out and he says, work. That's okay. There are a couple cable channels that make a living off of y what you say and what you do with yeah, masks. Why yeah. not just take that Well, I have done that. I said, wear a mask uh, and socially distance and all of those things. And people are going to do what they want to do. You know, when you see my rallies, a lot of those people are actually wearing masks. And they're outdoor rallies, which is very important. No, to me, it's not a big issue. To me, it's an issue. I say wear it. It's okay. Yeah, very good. I have no problem with it. China. You mentioned China. You brought up China. President Trump's second term. What do you do with China? Well, you know, I'm, we're going to do plenty with China, but we're not. Uh, what they did to us is a disgrace. It's a disgrace. When you say plenty specifically. Uh, well, I'm not going to talk to you about that, Eric. I mean, you know, give me a break. But uh, we're going to do plenty with respect to China. And... Uh, what they did to this country, to this world, everything, you're sitting there with that mask because of China, okay? And uh, it's disgraceful. It's a total disgrace. But you'll find out. Well, so the, the reason why I'm asking, uh, Mr. President, is because maybe some people out here are going, how would Biden handle China versus how would Trump handle it? Okay, well, Biden can handle it any way he wants. Biden's bought off by China. Biden took out a billion and a half dollars for his son to manage and make millions of dollars a year. Biden is weak on China. Biden's been weak on China from day one. Biden let China get away with murder. Biden let China away, steal us and rob us blind. I've taken out billions and billions of dollars from China with the tariffs and everything else we've done. And we were doing great, and then we got hit by the pandemic, by the, as I call it, the plague, the plague that came out of China. So well, you'll find out. Okay. Um, very quickly, we only have a couple minutes before we go to break and get to some of the audience questions. Um, the polls, the polls had you trailing. You've tightened the polls. What do you attribute that to? And should we even watch the polls? Well, I watch polls, but the polls are fake, just like the reporting. Uh, I think we're winning. I think we're winning big. I think we're winning in Florida. I think we're winning in North Carolina and Arizona. And I think we're winning in Nevada. We've got a governor out there that I don't trust, but that's all right. I think that all of these uh, ballots that they're sending, these millions of ballots, are very dangerous. Uh, Supreme Court made an unbelievable decision yesterday when he allowed one of the states to go where they allowed one of the states to go. Yeah, Pennsylvania. The Pennsylvania the craziest, is now it's allowed. The craziest thing anybody's ever heard, because that could delay the results of the election based on one state. It's uh, just a crazy decision, but. That's what we have to deal very, with. Very important state. Could be very the deciding state. And I'm doing very well there. We're very well in Pennsylvania. But you would think you'd want to have the votes counted, tabulated, finished by the evening of November 3rd. Not long after that. It could be long after that. What a decision by the Supreme Court. Very good. Pennsylvania, again, up to possibly three days after November 3rd to continue to count the votes. Possibly could, a lot longer than could that. Be, could be. We're going to come right back and answer your questions, questions from the town hall audience, when we come right back with the Commander-in-Chief.
Welcome to my home Stormwatch 7 Weather Center. This is where I forecast the weather. And from my living room with Gus, my spare bedroom. And we called and you guys showed up with a lot of pertinent questions. Mr. Commander Chief, take a listen to T.J. Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. Hi, um, I'm from Baltimore, and sadly, I lost my cousin to murder in 2003 and my brother in 2017. I work with countless parents who have lost their children to the crime epidemic, and most don't care about political affiliation. They care about right. competent and honest leadership. Undoubtedly, my city, like many other urban centers, has its share of problems, many of which are historical and at their root economical. Besides criminal justice reform and the, H, um, and the uh, assistance with HBCUs, what has your administration done specifically for inner city black Americans over the last four years? And what are your plans moving forward for inner city black Americans understanding the destruction that segregation and redlining continues to have on these communities? Yeah, I mean, it's a very fair question, but we can't just say, you know, forgetting about criminal justice reform. I got criminal justice reform done, prison reform done, opportunity zones, TJ, is another one that, you know, very important opportunity zones. But the thing that, uh, when you ask a question like that, uh, there's so, if, if you just look at where the problem is, Democrat run cities, states, but Democrat run, you say Baltimore, Democrat run exclusively has been for a hundred years and they've let you down they've let everybody down they've let our country down uh, you go to other areas where you have very similar problems to baltimore democrat run in every instance every instance uh, now they have no cash bail they have all sorts of things that nobody would even think of and they allow they've allowed it to get out of control this is not taking place in Republican areas. It's just not. And that's the problem. We need our police to be great, and they are great. We've had endorsements from almost everybody. Uh, and uh, they have to be allowed to do their job. And if there's bad ones, we'll weed them out. You know, we'll weed them out. But uh, for the most part, like a, a tremendously high number, they've done their job. But with stronger policing in Baltimore, perhaps you wouldn't have had those two tragic events. So I fully understand. But these are Democrat-run cities. Mr. President, Problem. you, um, Ice Cube, the, the rapper yeah. and celebrity uh, movie star, approached you, both, both campaigns, both yours and the Biden campaign. You came up with some money. President Biden said, we'll look at it after the election. You couldn't come up with an idea. 
you won that one. What should have Biden do have done? Well, look, that's up to them. They, they, Biden has done very little, and he's done very little for the African American community. And if you look at what they've done over the years, very, very little, nothing. 1994 was a disaster, what he did, okay, for the black community and, frankly, for the Hispanic community. And I think that's being reflected in the polls, and you're seeing what's happening. People now understand but, it. But it, it's, it's difficult for a Republican, even yourself, to get anywhere north of 10 percent. Yeah, but we're doing not badly, and, frankly, we should be — we should get 100 percent. And I say this. I say it loudly and clearly. No president has done what I've done in the most positive sense for the African-American community other than Abraham Lincoln, and it's true. When you think of criminal justice reform and prison reform and what I've done for the historically black colleges and universities and opportunity zones, nobody's done all these things. And people maybe don't like to talk about it, but nobody's done what I've done except with the exception, I say, of Abraham Lincoln. And nobody even calls me out on that because they know it's true. We should get tremendous votes from the African-American community. And we're doing better than a Republican would do, but we should do way better than that. You know, it's almost like habit. You vote for a Democrat at a habit. But look what they've done. Look what they've done. We're just talking about Baltimore. Look at what a disaster Baltimore is. Look at what a disaster so many of these Democrat cities are. So, but that's what it is. But Let, let's take a listen that. to Julia Ferrara. She's a first-time voter and independent as well. Hi, Mr. President. Hi. As a first-time voter, watching this election has been filled with so much negativity. So what is one positive thing you can say about the Democratic Party? I, I may need a little time for that. <laughs> I may have to think about it. Well, I'll tell you one thing. They stick together. I disagree with their politics. Uh, I think it's uh, — I think some of the things they do are horrible, whether it's uh, their views on crime, law and order, their uh, sanctuary cities, no borders. They don't want borders. They want to raise your taxes. They want to quadruple your taxes, actually. Think of it. They want to quadruple your taxes. They want to get rid of your guns, Second Amendment. I think their politics are horrible, but they always stick together. You don't have freelancers like you do in the Republican Party. We have freelancers. and. The freelancers hurt our party very badly. But the one thing I say, and I say it to you, I've said that to you before, they do stick together. Yeah. Mr. President, we have uh, Walter Blanks. He's an independent, undecided uh, voter as well. I think this is an important one to a lot of our viewers who are right now at home who are concerned about school choice. Hello, Mr. President. You often say that school choice is the civil rights issue of our, of our right. time. And as someone from Ohio who's benefited from school choice and is living a better life because of it. I mean, just last year I sat next to you, essentially told you I was coming for your job. I remember. Um, <laughs> I remember. But, um, specifically, how do you plan to give more children access to a better education, especially in low-income communities and communities of color? Well, charter schools are very important. School choice is very important. It's a great question. And it really is. It's the civil rights issue of our time. And the Democrats are locked into the public school system. And, you know, you know the reason. It's obvious the reason. But they're locked in. And they're never going to change. They want charter schools out. They don't want school choice. And right there, that, that alone is reasons for them to lose this election. Yep. But good job you're doing. I remember you. <laughs> so a lot of suburban moms are, are, are wanting to hear your yeah. opinion on school choice and also... Well, there's a reason why suburban moms, I mean, I think we're doing very well with that. But something very important is I ended the regulation that would have allowed projects, low-income housing, and a lot of problems into suburbia. And I ended it. And if Biden got in, they would take that regulation and quadruple it, just like they're going to quadruple taxes and destroy suburbia. So, so you're, you're I think gonna we're going to do very you're well. You're protecting the school choice. I'm protecting and people schools. in suburbia. Yeah. And I'm also protecting that. But I'm, I'm protecting the suburban mom and dad. And I'm protecting them very strongly. This is a regulation, which you know all about, that was a disaster. I've terminated it. I have a, a special uh, request for the control room. The, the friend of mine, when he heard I was doing a town hall with the president, he said, I, I have to get a question and I can't be here. Control room, I hope you have it queued up. Let's take a listen to a friend of mine, and you may know this guy from football, Brett Favre. 
Hello, Mr. President. My question is, the NBA and the NFL are struggling with lower ratings as fans clearly do not want political messaging mixed with their sports. So how should the leagues support and promote an anti-racism position without becoming political and alienating fans? Thank you. Well, Brett is a great guy, okay? I know him, you know him, and uh, a champion, a winner. I think the NBA and, I mean, NBA ratings were down 70% more than that for their finale, for their big, you know, deal. And the NFL's way down. People don't want to see uh, all of the politics. They've got other politics with me and with everybody else. And they don't want to see it with football and sports on Sunday or whenever they happen to be watching. I think it's had a huge impact on sports, a huge negative impact on sports. And I think what the uh, football ought to get back to football and basketball to basketball and let politics remain separate. And if people want to protest, they can. But they shouldn't be protesting on the sidelines during a football game, especially when they're making $10 million a year for something that they'd be doing anyway for free if they weren't in the league or the NFL or in the NBA. But the NBA in particular, I mean, their ratings have gone down. I've never seen anything like it. But the NFL, too. People don't want to see it. And they want to have these players stand and salute or put their hand over their heart or at least stand for the national anthem and salute. They want to, they want to respect the American flag. They want respect for our country. They want respect for the American flag. What's it going to take? What are the NBA, the NFL, Major League Baseball, what are they they're going to need to do to get President Trump back as a fan? Well, they're going to have to start respecting our country. Very simple. And you start by respecting our flag. And a lot of people agree with me on that. Thank you. Okay, let's do this. Let's take another question from the audience, and this may dovetail into the, what we were just talking about right here. Ed Norris, uh, Ed Norris, are you the microphone? There he is. Yes, Sam. Mr. President, hell have no fury like a vested interest masquerading as a moral principle. Because of exactly this, we watched cities burned and looted while police officers were told to stand down. The residual effect has been even worse. Police officers of all ranks are retiring or quitting in staggering numbers because they've been portrayed as murderous thugs. Well, there's absolutely no data to support the claim. Right. Those who remain are reluctant to do their job for fear of being targeted by activist prosecutors. The results been skyrocketing crime throughout the United States. What can be done to debunk the lie being told and convince police officers they'll be protected if they act in good faith so we can make America safe again? Uh, by the way, Ed is a former colonel of Maryland State Police. Good. I could see that. Central casting, actually. <laughs> uh, look, uh, our police officers have to, be, have to be allowed to do their job. They have to be not concerned with if they speak to somebody a little bit incorrectly, they're going to lose their pension, lose their family, lose everything. I mean, they're afraid to do anything nowadays. They have to be allowed to do their job, and we have to respect our police officers. It's a tough job, and it's a very dangerous job, more dangerous than ever. They have to be allowed to do their you job. Know, I, I think the number is about 120 Seattle police officers have resigned yeah, recently. No. Well, it, Seattle it, it's, in particular. It's, what they've, it's an epidemic, but... Sure. Um, and, and that happens when you have mayors that don't support their police departments. What, is there anything the federal government can do, the, the administration can do, to keep, peop, to keep cops in their jobs? Uh, we can give them support morally, financially. We can help them with things. We can do a lot. But when you see the two police officers shot in a car a week ago, two weeks ago, when you see the kind of things happening, and if people aren't going to be respecting our police. Our police are being put at a tremendous disadvantage because of our politicians. Our politicians are hurting our police, and we can't let that happen. You know, I've gotten the endorsement in this run for, by almost every police department, by every law enforcement group, even New York City's finest, which has really been stifled because they're afraid to do anything. You can't do anything. They'll end up losing everything they have. And I've gotten tremendous endorsements, Chicago, Florida, Texas, everybody. I mean, I would say almost all of them, because I have respect for the police. We have to respect our police. Without our police, we would be living in a whole different world. Do, do, is there systemic racism within police departments, and is there any sort of retraining that they need 
with given the new the, the new world we live in? Well, I mean, that's always the question you get asked. Is there? And I guess there probably is, and that's very sad. There is, and I think there's not much. Or hopefully, there's not much. But don't forget, a lot of our police departments are made up of Hispanic Americans, African Americans, Asian Americans. I mean, really, it's not like it was 20, 25 years ago, I guess. But I guess there always is, and it's a shame. It's a shame. But we have to respect our police, and we have to let them do their job. Mr. President, stay right there. Sinclair Audience America this week, the town hall from the White House. We will be back with more of your questions. For the president. save lives by donating blood, ABC7, and Van Hi, hi, Lynn. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, thank you for your leadership and understanding the importance of reopening schools safely. And my question that I hear a lot from educators like myself across the United States, will educators and students be given priority for COVID vaccinations um, when they're available after, of course, health care workers and first responders? So we're looking at it very strongly. I will say this, you know, Baron Trump had it. He's a young man. And it was gone before, uh, practically before they even told us he had it. Uh, young people do very well. 99.9% uh, are primary. And, and the educators, that's a little bit different. They're older in, you know, in the cases where they are older. But I will say we really have to take care of our seniors because this is a disease we've learned a lot. This is a disease that really is affecting the seniors with his, you know, especially where there's a heart problem, a diabetes problem. That's got to be the focus. But yeah, at a certain, Lynn, at a certain age level, absolutely, I agree 100%. But you see the kind of numbers for young people, under 20, under 25, it's like, not bad. How do Thank you, you. How do you feel? I feel great. I feel really good. I, I had it and recovered quickly. I feel good, really good. And First Lady had it? She's, she had it. How's she she's doing? doing very well. I mean, she had, she had it, and she, she, I would say, very well. And Barron, I, again, I say it was, he's got it. How's he doing? He doesn't have it anymore, you know. Yeah. They have a strong immune system, stronger than us, I guess. It's pretty, pretty good.
Okay, sir, th th I love this question. This is Mario. Uh, I'm sorry, Mario Bramick. Mario, your question. Mr. President, it's great seeing you. Thank um, you. My family left Cuba. I left with my family yeah. in 1960, fleeing communist Cuba to right. come to America for the American dream. Small and family businesses are critical to Hispanic families for economic prosperity. Their economic future depends on free enterprise and less government regulation to survive and grow. Socialism threatens these families' very way of life. True. Vice President Biden seems like he strongly supports socialistic government intrusion into small businesses. In your second term, as we are rebuilding our economy, how will you protect Hispanic family-owned businesses from liberal progressive policies that would jeopardize these Hispanic families to gain the American dream? Okay, so I have tremendous Hispanic support, as you know. Yes. We've been working with Hispanic small businessmen, and you know, and women. Uh, they're great business people. The Hispanics are great business people. We've been working, billions and billions of dollars have been uh, allocated to small businesses for many people, but Hispanic people have been really, really, um, they benefited by what we've done. Cuba, I just got the Bay of Pigs Award. They love what I'm doing. And Biden is a Castro person. He's totally a Castro. Obama and Biden sold out to Cuba, and I ended that horrible deal. And in terms of popularity with the Cuban population in Miami, it's very high. You know that. And we're going to keep it that way. Thank you very much. Mr. President, 11 million people in Cuba. They're very close. Most of the world is trading with Cuba. We're not. Is there an opportunity in a second term to maybe renegotiate with Cuba to open up those lines of, of trade? At the right time, but they have to treat people properly. What they've done in terms of a regime, and you can say it better than anybody, what they've done in terms of a regime is deplorable and horrible. So it's all human rights uh, issues that, that you have. Well, closing. it is. It is. And, you know, you have people living in Miami who have suffered greatly. And we're working with them and very close. So I'm very close to the Cuban American population. I don't know. For whatever reason, we've become very close. Uh, Venezuela, too. You take a look at what's going on in Venezuela. Uh, and this is all as per the question. They get into the socialism thing. They destroy the country. This country will never be a socialist country. They get into socialism and everything is destroyed. It sounds good. You get everything for nothing, everything free. But that doesn't last very long. And you look at Venezuela. It was a wealthy country just a short while ago. Now they have no food. They have no water. They have no medicine. They have nothing. But we're, wa we're watching that whole situation. Cuba, Venezuela, all very, very Nicaragua, by the way, uh, very closely. Thank you very much. So one of the things that people say is uh, this COVID relief, a lot of the money, the trillions upon trillions, and now I guess that we're somewhere between a $1.8 trillion offer and a $2.4 trillion ask yeah. on one side, the other, is there going to be somewhere meeting in the middle? And we're talking trillions of dollars, Mr. President. That's a lot of displacement All because of, of money. China. All because of China. It is a lot. But the fact is that it was not... The American people that caused this problem. This was caused by China. All by China. You make them pay? Uh, you'll watch. You'll watch. Let's talk about the grander economies. I think, to me included, I come from the economic world. I used to do business shows. I used to talk to you about business 10, 15 years ago. I'm pleasantly surprised, but surprised that the stock market shows as much strength as it does. Now, those on the left will say, well, Everyone isn't in the stock market. A lot of people are. And a lot of um, capital raising, capital expenditures come from the equities markets. They're very strong, surprisingly strong. Is the rest of the economy as strong as the stock market is? I think we built a great foundation. And that's why even during, I think we're rounding the turn. I say it, and I, I mean it 100%. With the vaccines coming, therapeutics, we're rounding the turn on COVID. But if we didn't build a strong base like I built for the first three and a half years, we would not be in the position we're at now. I mean, we have a stock market that's almost at an all-time high. I think it will be. And the biggest headwind is Biden, because if he got elected, this thing will crash. It's a headwind. It really is a bad headwind. Somebody said it very well on uh, 
one of your favorite shows today. They said it very, very well. It's a big headwind. So uh, I think we're going to have a tremendous year next year. We're going to cut taxes. Again, he's going to raise taxes, quadruple taxes, quadruple regulations that I've been able to cut that were meaningless, but they made it impossible to do business. So we're going to have a great year next year. We're going to cut taxes and many other things, but it's going to be a very strong year. You mentioned a couple of things in that answer. One of them was we're going to get a vaccine and we're going to get some help. I think those two things are driving the stock market right now. Do you believe the vaccine is, is imminent? Very soon, very soon. Great, great companies, and uh, it's going to happen very soon. Well, that will certainly be some wind in the, in the economies. No, that will be a great thing. It's going to happen without, but we're going to have a vaccine very soon. And we have therapeutics that are fantastic. We have meaning things that help you get better. You look at the mortality rate, 85 percent. I mean, what we've done is incredible in this short period of time over a seven-month period. Uh, no, we've done a good job. And, and one final question on the economy. I, you have to be blind not to walk around and see a lot of the brick-and-mortar stores, the, the small bodegas on the street. They're closing. Now, some of the online retailers are doing phenomenally. Car sales are strong. But that was a big part of the yeah. economy. Have, yeah. we, have we just rewritten the rules of the economy? Well, I think so. But I think once it gets going and once the COVID's gone and everything else, uh, you're going to see that also open. But if you look at retail sales, they're doing fantastic. Fantastically, if you look at cars, car sales, real estate, housing, people can't believe it. Housing is doing better than it was doing before. So we have a very powerful foundation. Cars, auto sales. No, it's used, incredible. Used car sales are yep. very, very big indicator. Incredible. And, and prices are, are skyrocketing with used car sales. Uh, COVID spiking. The number of cases are spiking. Now, I also went to even NBC News, and they, they put co deaths by day. You said, the word, you said the word cases. And the reason cases is because we test. Yeah. We have more tests than any other country in the world by quadruple. We test more than anybody, and that's good. But where it's bad is it allows the fake news to do nothing but talk about cases. Now, if we cut the testing in half, you'd have half the number of cases. And if we cut it in half again, you'd have another half the number in cases. So it's one of those things. So we have the best testing in the world, but it shows the most cases. Uh, other countries don't test, they don't have cases. Very simple. I, I think there's, a, there's a, a math equation in there, sir. I think if the cases are going up, but the, the deaths are staying even, that means the death rate, the mortality rate is plummeting. It's yeah, but, dropping. But actually, deaths are going down. That's what I mean. They're, they're yeah. de even the down, with cases going up, something is, what, like him or not, like us or not, something is right about that. Yeah. If deaths yeah. are flat to down, that's, that's the real indicator. Right. Now, the, the testing does tell you where to look and, you know, what area, where is the problem. But we're finding cases because we test. If you didn't test, I mean, one particular country came, and I'm friendly with a lot of the leaders. I say, do you test? No, we don't test. And the country shows no cases. You wouldn't know they even have a problem. Why do you think no China cases. has so few cases? Well, I think they have a lot of death, but they don't report it. They have a lot of death, but they don't report it. Do you think we're over-reporting COVID? In other words, I don't want to get into that. It gets too complicated, too controversial. I don't want to be controversial. I, want to, I don't want to be controversial for a change. <laughs> but we certainly report, and other countries don't. And, you know, China, look, do you believe the numbers in China, you know, where they have a very small... Everybody knows how badly China got hit. Now, they should have stopped it from coming in here, but China was hit hard. And I won't mention other countries, but other countries were hit really hard, much harder than they report. All right, Mr. President, stay right there. We have one more block with the president. We'll ask, answer your questions. America This Week, Town Hall, from the White House. We're all spending more time in our home sweet homes. The cold weather's on its way, and if you're looking through old windows and doors, you're looking at big energy bills to keep you warm and comfortable this winter. That's why we're having our biggest sale of the year. 
Call 855-57-CREEK-NOW to get 25% off all windows and doors for a limited time with incredible finance options during our biggest sale of the year. My drug use ended up taking away my children. My first marriage, I was spending $800 to $1,000 a day. I was hurting everybody around me. I always worked on cars. But once I started making more money, I could afford more. So I did more. I didn't know how to stop. The Recovery Centers of America taught me that I didn't have to live the way I was living. The staff at Recovery Centers of America believed. All right, we're back with the President of the United States from the White House Town Hall, Sinclair, America, this week. We have a question from the Town Hall audience. Hey, Mr. President, uh, Coach Kennedy, I uh, coach uh, football up in Bremerton, Washington. Good. And I was the one that was terminated for praying after the football game. Oh, boy. And I know all about that. Terrible. I've been fighting with the court systems and especially with the uh, Ninth Circuit, which we're getting ready to go to again. Um, for the First Amendment, the freedom of speech and freedom of religion, what are you going to do in the next four years? I know you did a lot in the first four years for us. What are you going to do in the next four years for our courts and to protect the, uh, the First Amendment? Well, I did a lot for you, by the way, because I put a lot of new judges on the Ninth Circuit. Amen, and I think sir. you're going to get a fair shake. So maybe we'll start right there. And, Coach, I know about your case, and I hope you're going to win. I hope you're going to win that case, okay? I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but I hope you're going to win. Thank you, Coach. I'll bet you're a good coach, too. Thank you very much. Speaking of judges, let's talk a little bit about your, your recent nomination, your nominee, Amy Coney Barrett. Um, a lot of people say, okay, that's three. What else can he do? you think there'll be any more vacancies in the next four years? So in the next four, that's one of the reasons it's so important to go out and vote, because he's going to put in radical left judges, which will destroy our country. One of the most important things a president does is Supreme Court justices. And you can't let that happen. He doesn't even want to talk about it. Doesn't want to, first of all, he doesn't know what's going on, period. But he doesn't want to talk about who he's going to put on. He's got to show, who are you going to put on? Who are the people? Give us a pool. I have 45 names I'll only take from that pool. Give us a pool of people. He doesn't want to talk about it. And, you know, he wants to pack the court. You know all about that. Let's talk about that. Be a terrible thing for this country. Terrible. So packing the court would be, if he won, they would add three seats to the Supreme Court to turn or it from a Or maybe more than that. And maybe they'll take uh, Washington, D.C. They'll take the District of Columbia and make it a state. So you have two senators and numerous congressmen and women. The whole thing is people have to know about this. But he wants to pack the court. Then he's going to pack the court, even if he says he's not going to. Look, he said he's not going to frack, right? There's no fracking. No fracking. Then he gets to Pennsylvania, says we'll frack. And the, the press never even talks to him about it. He goes for a year that he's not going to frack. Then he goes to Pennsylvania, and he says, eh, maybe we'll frack. It's terrible. And the press doesn't call him out. You have a... You have a we have a, a Supreme Court justice that's in his 80s, a, a liberal. There's also uh, Clarence Thomas, who's indicated he may want to retire at some point. That could be too. Well, he's not in his 80s. I think he's no, 74. No, no, Breyer, the other, the, the, oh, the liberal, yeah, the liberal in his Clarence. 80s. I thought you said and, but no, both of them. So there could be two vacancies coming up in the next four years. You got ideas? Well, I don't want to talk about people before the fact. I mean, actually, Clarence is like in his 
73, 74, and a great gentleman, great gentleman, both great gentlemen. No, I don't want to be talking about people. If they, you know, they should stay as long as they right. want. Let's get to Dorian. Dorian Francis, you have a question? Hello, Mr. President. Um, I'm a student at Bowie State University in Bowie, Maryland, uh, an HBCU. Good. What in the next four years do you plan on doing for HBCUs to keep us up and running and keep us running smoothly and, and well, keep benefiting us? Well, I've done a lot because I funded you with long-term financing, which Obama didn't do and nobody else did. And uh, the heads of the colleges, as you know, would come up here on a yearly basis looking for money. And after the third year, I said, why do you guys keep coming up? I liked them. A number of them are friends of mine. I said, why do you keep coming up? I said, don't you have like five year, 10 year, you know, some kind of funding? They said, no, every year we have to come up. And one of them, a great guy, he said, I come up and I feel like a beggar. And what did I do? I took care of them, right? Every year, more money than they asked for. I got a more, I said, you need more than that. I got a more money than that they asked for. Do I get credit for it? Absolutely not, but I feel very good about it. Mr. President, one of the things, um, when you were first elected, it was out there, it was one of those reach across the aisle ideas that it gained a lot of steam for a while, then went away, infrastructure. It's a, it's a great opportunity to create a ton of jobs and we all need right. our roads, bridges need fixing. Where's the infrastructure plan? Well, it it's happening back? and it's going to happen and we've done a lot of infrastructure. You know, the wall is being built and we're doing 10 miles, 10 miles a week. We'll be up to ultimately 520 something miles, 529 miles. It'll be completed very soon. It's had a huge impact on the on the southern border. The numbers are unbelievable. The numbers of drugs and all of the things that were pouring through into our country. But we've now built, uh, we're getting close to a number that you won't even believe. And we're doing it at 10 miles a week. That's a lot. And it'll be very quickly finished. And Mexico's paying for the wall, by the way, just in case you had any question. Mexico is paying for the wall. Oh. But um, that's considered infrastructure. You know, it's one of the largest infrastructure jobs we've ever had in the history of our country. But it'll be finished very soon. Are, are we talking some sort of tariff with Mexico? Are we talking? We're talking about fees going in to Mexico. Yes, we are. Fees to to yeah. to enter Roads. and leave and Roads, transportation. Yes. Correct. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Now, how well, do you get, how do you get China to pay for the uh, the COVID relief that we're? Spending? Well, we'll see about that. We'll we'll work on that one next, maybe. Okay, uh, we got a t two minutes till a break, Mr. President. A lot of people are probably wondering. Let's what what you got two weeks to the election. Make your closing argument. So we have done the greatest job. We've created the greatest economy in history. There's never been anything like it. And then we got hit with the plague. We had the best African-American numbers. If you look at our unemployment numbers, African-American, Asian-American, Hispanic-American, the best numbers ever, no matter where you look, with high school education, without, you could graduate first in your class at MIT, didn't matter the best numbers. Our country was doing the best it ever did. You understand this. Stock market at an all-time high. Everybody was happy. The country was coming together. We got hit. I closed it, saved millions of lives. Now I'm rebuilding it again. We're way ahead of schedule. Next year is going to be a, a great year. We are way ahead of schedule. Next year is going to be a great economic year for this country. The other side wants to raise your taxes. They want to raise out regulations. They'll drive everybody out we'll end up in a depression. We're gonna do a great job and we're gonna finish it up. We were doing such a job, everything was flawless, it was perfect. In addition to that, I've rebuilt our military. In addition to that, we've done many, many other things, so many other things, including Space Force. We came up, we needed Space Force. I never even campaigned on that. I realized after I became president, we ha I looked at Russia, I looked at China, we had to have it, all approved. 75 years it's been since a new branch of the military came in. So we've done a lot and we're going to uh, finish it just like we did. We're going to finish it strong. But it's only this great foundation that I built would allow us to be sitting here today with almost a stock market that's an all-time high. That means 401ks. It means your stocks, as you say, everybody benefits. So, and I think we're doing very well. We will be right back.
United States, appreciate your time, Mr. President. I want to say thank you. Thank, thank you, you to the White House staff. Thank you to the audience. And again, I will say this one more time. We've offered this to the President, Vice President, Vice President Joe Biden. We haven't heard back. That offer stands. He's sleeping. <laughs> he's, he's sleeping. <laughs> Mr. President, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, everybody. Hope thank you, you everybody. <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. The Fall Roofing Spectacular at Rooftop Designs. Get a new roof.